Hello and welcome to episode 2 of Strike Fighters North Vietnam. We're back today to fly with Win Van Koch of the Vietnam People's Air Force as he pits his outdated MiG-17 fighter against the technological might and sheer numbers of the American military. Big thanks to everybody for such an enthusiastic response to the opening episode of this series. People seem to be quite excited by it. I am too. Should be lots of fun going forward. That new opening that we just saw is entirely Vietnamese music, in case you were wondering. The first few bars is some traditional Vietnamese music, followed by the ripping guitar solos of Tung Lin of the CBC band. The CBC band was a Vietnamese rock band popular in South Vietnam during the war, and the song is The Greatest Love from 1967. So not only does it freaking rock, but it's also period appropriate, which is a really cool tie-in. We're here at Phu Kien Air Base, just north of Hanoi, home of the 921st Fighter Regiment, 1st Flight, Section A. The date is April 5th, 1965. It's been a month and three days since our last mission. That's going to be uh, pretty much our standard mission interval during this campaign. We have three years to get through to reach the end of Operation Rolling Thunder, 65 to 68. So I don't want to have 100 episodes or more getting through all that. So I've set the mission spacing, so we'll do it in around 30 instead. Hopefully, if my math was right. Today's mission objective is going to be to intercept an enemy flight approaching Yen Bai. Prevent the enemy flight from reaching its target. Our call sign today will be Tiger. Now, oh, that's actually appropriate this time. Uh, we'll be flying eight MiG-17 Fresco A's. That's going to be a significant portion of the squadron all up at once. Takeoff time will be 8.12 in the morning. We'll be intercepting at around 8.19, and we should be back to Fukien at 8.28 in the morning. Pretty simple loadout today. I'm back in aircraft 10.30. Uh, despite the heavy damage from both the 20mm cannons and the crash landing across the river, uh, the aircraft was repaired, flown back to Fukien, and now it's ready for combat once again. I'm equipping the two 400 liter drop tanks. Since we had such an issue with fuel last time, I, I didn't think we were going to since the airplane doesn't have an afterburner, but we ended up being on fumes anyways right towards the end, and then obviously getting the fuel tank shot full of holes you know, didn't help either, but we were real low on fuel anyway. So let's go ahead and just take the 400 liters uh, extra along with us today, and then we don't have to worry about it so much. Nothing else mounted on the inner pylons this time. We're just going to go with a straight, historically correct Vietnamese fighter configuration on this mission. No air to air rockets. We have a total takeoff weight of 13,010 pounds. All eight of the other aircraft are equipped similarly, so let's move on. Looking at the map now, you can see our flight path stays very close to home. Uh, we'll be intercepting out to the west, so most likely Air Force planes again, coming in from Thailand. Here we are, the Sao Zhou Squadron at Phu Kien. We'll take off to the east and climb to 3,000 meters before swinging around to the left. It's going to take a few critical minutes to get the whole squadron airborne, but I don't think we have the time to rendezvous properly, so I'll be heading right to the next waypoint, and hopefully everybody can catch up. They want us over Yen Bai by 6 minutes and 50 seconds. Like last mission, they want us down at 2,300 meters, but I'm not doing that. We'll stay up around 4,000 meters so that we can dive down on the bogeys once we see them. We're at a severe speed disadvantage here with our lack of afterburners, so we may only get one pass at them. I want to make sure that I can trade that altitude for airspeed during the attack. After intercepting, we'll circle back to the southeast and follow the Red River back to Fukien for landing. Over on the right here, so far I'm the only known ace at the moment with my seven kills from last mission's turkey shoot. Now, don't expect missions going forward to be that easy. That was the very first day of the war, and America was overconfident and not ready for us. From here on out, it's only going to get harder as we go along. And finally, moving to the roster. <laughs> There's so many people today, I'm not even going to go through the whole list. But, notable names are Trang C. Tao as my wingman in Tiger 2. And the squadron leader, Lieutenant Colonel Tai Kang Fook, will be leading the second flight of aircraft today. <laughs> we also have Ho Chi Sam with us. And all I can imagine is a weird mashup of Ho Chi Minh and Uncle Sam. <laughs> Uh, we have a total of 20 pilots in the squadron, and 8 are going up today. 
Now, it's situations like this that can lead to disaster if we don't watch out. If a mission goes sideways on us and we all get shot down, that's like almost 50% of the squadron lost in one day. Now, that's happened to me before, and two missions in a row like that can get you pulled right off the front line and back into China for recuperation. And then the campaign is finished, uh, and I want to avoid that if possible. Okay, that's going to sum up this morning's briefing. Most likely F-105s as our target with unknown amounts of escorts. Let's go fire up our MiGs and get down to business. We'll see you out there. Here we are out on runway 9 at Fukien, waiting for the tower to clear us for our departure. Alright, that's it. We've got clearance to go. Flight controls are good, free and clear. Full power. VK-1 slowly spooling up to full power. As we come up to speed, we'll be looking to rotate it around 250 kilometers per hour. There's 200. And there's 250 on the airspeed indicator as we just tilt the nose back and gently fly the MiG right off the asphalt. Gear is up and flaps are up. This poor canopy <laughs> in this airplane, oh my god, it just looks like somebody threw a raccoon into this cockpit and the thing just went nuts trying to claw its way out through the plexiglass because this thing, <laughs> it's, it's had a hard life as Bob Ross would say. Out to the right is the sprawling metropolis of Hanoi. Now in the briefing I said that I was going to head right to the next waypoint, uh, waypoint 3 and then 4. I've actually changed my mind uh, during the loading screen. And uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to reduce power to cruise and I'm just going to fly the pattern once and uh, I'm going to let the rest of the squadron take off and form up with me. I decided that I would rather be slightly late to the intercept point, but have the whole force of the squadron with me, rather than be strung out, you know, all over the sky. So we're just going to fly the pattern once, and then as we come back around to upwind, I'm going to start my climb up to 3,000 meters. Now, in the meantime, this gives me the perfect opportunity to talk to you about the MiG-17 a little bit. The MiG-17, NATO codename Fresco is a transonic fighter produced by the Soviet Union in the 1950s and would go on to fly for more than 20 countries worldwide and is still flying in active service today. Work began on the MiG-17 in 1949 at the Mikoyan Gurevich Design Bureau in Moscow. While their previous fighter, the MiG-15, was about to become a game-changing success over Korea, the aircraft still had many problems that needed to be addressed. For example, the MiG-15 was uncontrollable over Mach 0.92. It also had a tendency to enter a spin upon stall that was unrecoverable. The MiG-17 was originally going to be simply an advanced model of the 15, but so many changes finally went into the new aircraft that it was given its own designation. However, this explains why the two fighters are so similar looking. Both aircraft were powered by the VK-1 engine which was a copy of the British Rolls-Royce Neen. This came about because in 1946, keen to improve post-war relations with the Soviets, Britain authorized the export of 40 Neen engines along with blueprints and technical information. These 40 units were reverse engineered and the resulting unauthorized VK-1 would go on to power thousands of MiG-15 and 17 aircraft. Also shared between the two MiGs, were the entire forward fuselage, the landing gear, and the gun installation. Where the 17 was improved was in its wings, which were thinner and had a more pronounced wing and tail sweep for retaining control up to and beyond Mach 1, and had better maneuverability at high altitudes. The plane also added a third wing fence and a ventral fin under the rear fuselage for better maneuverability at slow speeds. The MiG-17 first flew in January of 1950. Production began in August of 1951 
and aircraft delivery began in October of 52. The MiG-17 Fresco A was the basic day fighter version that we are flying here today. By 1953, the improved MiG-17F was introduced and added an afterburner to the VK-1 engine. This added around 1,500 additional pounds of thrust and nearly doubled climb speed. With the addition of a radar gun sight copied from American F-86 Sabres, the Fresco C became the most popular variant of the aircraft. Next to arrive in service was the MiG-17 PF, or the Fresco D, and this was the definitive all-weather fighter version. Equipped with an improved afterburning VK-1 engine and the Isam Rudd RP-2 radar, the Fresco D also removed the 37mm cannon, replacing it with a third 23mm instead. Several other variants were produced or converted in small batches, including a reconnaissance version and the MiG-17 PM, which removed the guns altogether and instead sported four radar-guided air-to-air missiles. Less than 50 of these Fresco E's were produced. The MiG-17 was also built under license in China under the name the Shenyang J-5, as well as in Poland as the Lim-5. The MiG-17 did not fight in the Korean War, but first entered combat in 1958 over the Straits of Taiwan when Chinese MiGs fought with Taiwanese F-86 Sabres. During the 60s, the Vietnam People's Air Force took delivery of both MiG-17s from the USSR and J-5s from China. In 1965, North Vietnam had only one squadron of 36 MiGs, but by 1968 that number had grown to 180 aircraft. Three of the 16 North Vietnamese aces during the war were MiG-17 pilots. Production of the Fresco ended in 1958, but during that seven-year run, almost 11,000 aircraft were built in the Soviet Union, China, and Poland. More than 60 years later, MiG-17s are still flying in the Congo, Guinea, Mali, Madagascar, Sudan, Tanzania, and North Korea. Off to our left here, that's the Tam Dao mountain range. And off in the distance beyond it, it just at the, the edge of our vision, is the Red River. The Tam Dao Mountains are interesting. They were set aside by the French when they still owned Vietnam as a colony to build uh, several retreat villas up in the mountains. So it was a place where the wealthy would escape to to get away from the hustle and bustle of the city. Today the whole mountain range is a national park. And off to our right is the Lo River. This river flows out of the northwest and then uh, actually hooks up with the Red River just north of Hanoi and then they all flow out together towards the ocean. Here we can see a close-up view of the two 23mm cannons on the left side of the fuselage and that giant cigar on the right, that's the 37mm. Two o'clock, five miles, that'd be wicked close. That doesn't seem right. Let's double check with Red Crown on that. Let's. Uh, what is our nearest contact for real? Okay, yeah, six o'clock, twenty-five miles. So strange, spurious reporting of bandits to the north, which doesn't seem likely. I don't see anybody out there. So, still six o'clock, twenty-five miles. It's probably not our primary target. There we go. We've hit waypoint three. So we're going to swing around, and now we're going to head towards the intercept point. And we should uh, probably be seeing our primary targets pretty soon. I'm going to keep checking in with Red Crown. In real life, they would just be directing me uh, directly to whatever the primary target is, and then releasing me once I was within range of intercept. Obviously not how the game works, so I just have to keep checking in and then uh, decide which one is the primary target. Maybe check with the, the HUD every now and then. See, there we go. So I'm locked onto a Crusader. They're 20 miles away. Not my primary target. Oh. Somebody is engaging them down south, though. I 
and losing, apparently. Friendly MiGs down by the shoreline, tangling maybe with those Crusaders that I just uh, targeted, not sure. Hmm. Okay, we're coming over the north end of the Tamdao mountain range, and we're getting all sorts of weird reports. We've got one squadron at 50 miles away, which probably is not our primary target. We've got another squadron at 9 miles, but at 50,000 feet. That seems like another nonsense report. Let's check in again with Red Crown. There we go. 10 o'clock, 10 miles, Angels 5. That has to be our primary target, and it is. There are A4 Skyhawks incoming. Tally-ho, full throttle. Let's move to intercept. Less than nine miles now. They're just off the nose. Let's see if my wingmen will pick them up visually. It makes it easier to tell them to attack uh, if they already see the targets. There we go, I can see them. There are little dots there. So, flight one. Engage air. Flight two. Engage air. Picking up a ton of flak here below us as we're gonna flip up and over the top. Looks like four Skyhawks. There we go. MiGs diving all over the place on their way in. Oh good, they see them now. Took them long enough. Oh, it's eight Skyhawks. Look at that. It's a, uh, it's two flights. And a MiG-17 just shot something down that was not. An A4. Just off to my left, it's an F8 Crusader. So these guys are escorted. That's that's bad news, but uh, they're down one escort. One of my guys took care of him right off the bat. He was just off my left wing. Crazy. Okay, and now I've really screwed up because I didn't dive on these guys properly. I'm stuck behind them, and with no afterburner, I can't catch up to them. I'm having a problem here. We're firewalled, and... Uh, not not gaining on these guys quickly and with such heavy bullet drop with these cannons it's it's hard to shoot at distant targets I have to be really really close to ensure good hits but let's give it a trial shot maybe I can wing a guy from this distance It's hard to tell if they're actually dropping beyond him or in front of him. Oh, now they're slightly turning. Oh, got a friendly right at my one o'clock close. Oh, these guys are jinking. This is close enough. Guns, guns, guns! Oh, shit! Oh, and another one right off the wing. <laughs> man, two at once for me and a wingman. Okay, let's roll back over and get back on the tails of the rest of this flight here. This guy is pretty close. Could maybe do some damage on him. Ah. Damn it! Whoa! Something's passing over in front of my nose. Looks like an F-105, I think. Silver F-105. That's interesting. Alright, let's... Oh, man. Every round that I fire is a huge waste. Oh no, I see bombs falling. They just dropped on their target. So they're probably gonna hit in a minute. I don't know if you could see those, but there was the little dots of bombs falling off the bottom of the Skyhawk. Yep, there it is. Mission failed. Well, I, I had said from the outset that that was going to be expected sometimes. That uh, that doesn't mean that we still can't knock these guys down and put a hurt on their, their squadrons. The more we can shoot down now, that means the less they can send next time. So let's get right in on this guy. There we go. Clipped him with something. Final blow. Four a kill. He's going down. And here's another one. 
that time missing. I was trying to say before that every round that I fire that I miss is a huge, huge loss because my ammo is so limited. Oh, speaking of which, there goes the 37mm. We're out. I have maybe one burst of 23mm left. Alright, two is engaged nearby. So I either have... I'm either out of ammo, or I have one tiny burst of 23mm left, and I... I don't want to just pull the trigger to test it, so... I'm gonna get a nice close bead on this guy, this last A4, and I'm gonna pull the trigger and either... Nothing is gonna happen, or maybe we'll be able to shoot him down. So let's see. This looks good. Whoa! Oh man! Got him! It was like one round! Look at that! And he's spiraling down. Fuel coming out of his left wing. Let's spiral down with him. Down he goes. Alright, it's getting a little dangerous. Let's not plow into the ground ourselves. Level out, nice and close to the ground, and I'm going to disengage full power. I'm going to get out of here, because I'm definitely out of ammo. We're going to let the squadron keep uh, fighting. If they still have ammo, we'll let them... We'll let them do their thing. I don't want to, uh, I don't want to call for them to disengage if they're fighting with American planes. Because sometimes that, that gets them shot down. If they just say, oh, okay, I'm going to go home. And then they turn around and then, uh, you know, whatever fighter that they were fighting with shoots them down. So I want to try to avoid that. So let's just let them do their job. But I'm going to pull back to cruise speed here. Or cruise power, I should say. Cruise power leads to cruise speed. That's... How that works. And we'll dump the fuel tanks. Because they're probably empty. Okay, so two is still on somebody. Looks like he's kind of straight in level, so... I would venture to say that he is not tangling with escorts. He's probably chasing the remaining A4s. Yep, I see three little black dots in front of him. Pretty far away, though. Alright, I see one, two, three, four, f only five friendly Tiger Flight aircraft left. Six. Okay, so six left. So somewhere in the in the middle of that scrum, we lost two wingmen. And I'm not sure what happened, I didn't see it. Heading back south now, we're parallel with the Red River. We'll cross over that as we head into Hanoi. Out to the right in the distance, those A4s are retreating with some of my guys still following them. Oh, and somebody's shooting. Let's see who it is. Oh, it's Tiger 2. Look at that, he's just spraying lead out. Oh, he, oh he's getting some uh, getting some hits on that right A4. I saw a little sparkles from hits, but it wasn't enough to bring it down. There we go, he's shooting again. Oh, direct hit, down he goes. Ball of flame. Now he's moving on. <laughs> He was moving on to the other A4 and fired two little rounds, and that was the end for him. So now he's out of ammo. So, Tiger 2 disengage, return to base. Okay, well... Well, unpadlock, dude. You're out of ammo. Oh, somebody else is shooting now. Here we go, this guy is right behind where Tiger 2 just was. We can see Tiger 2's A4 crashing into the into the jungle in the distance. And now here goes this guy. This is an F8 Crusader. This is an escort that he just knocked down. And he is spinning wildly down to the earth. Look at this guy. The 23 and 37 millimeters really tore this Crusader up. The pilot's punched out and this thing's just gonna nosedive right into the jungle here. Interesting to note that that guy was from VF-94. Uh, 
the fact that they were so far north and coming from kind of the west, eh, maybe south, west, uh, I was suspecting that maybe that the Skyhawks and the Crusaders were marine aircraft out of Da Nang, but that guy was from a Navy squadron, so uh, maybe they just had a really long, circuitous route to bring them this far north. Anyways, there's Fukien off to my left. There's Hanoi just off the nose. We're gonna make it back to base this time. I still have plenty of fuel in the tank, no damage, so we'll make a normal approach uh, overhead 360 and landing. Now in real life, rules of engagement for the Americans were that they were not allowed to shoot down any MiG that had its wheels down, uh, which was a trick that sometimes Vietnamese pilots exploited during combat to, you know, be able to disengage and not get shot down. Uh, obviously the game doesn't follow any sort of rules like that, so let's do a check from Red Crown and make sure that there's no uh, baddies nearby that are going to shoot me down while I'm slow in the pattern. Nope, nearest one is, uh, he's behind me at 15 miles, so shouldn't be a factor. We do the overhead 360 in order to give us some protection from any, um, you know, fighters that would maybe be on my tail. The air defenses around the airbase would be able to shoot it at anyone who is chasing me, you know, hopefully. In theory, it doesn't always work out, but... Alright, we're right on center line. Fukien elevation is 100 meters. So we're going to come right down the center line here and then make our break and then enter the pattern and drop down to pattern altitude, which will be in the neighborhood of around 400 meters. Throttle down and brake to the left. There's 500 kilometers an hour. And rolling out on downwind, hitting 400 kilometers an hour, which is our gear speed. Flaps is 350, which we're just touching right now. And gear and flaps down will get into landing configuration. There we go, we're at 350 meters. So slightly low, and we're just a beam of the touchdown point. So I'm going to begin my nice, gentle turn into base and roll out on final. We just lost another wingman somewhere. I uh, don't know what caused that. That's unfortunate. Got to watch these radio masts coming around uh, to land. But we're, we're clear of them here. Two hundred and fifty kilometers an hour as we're coming down, about to hit the threshold. Stall speed is two hundred. And we're just getting a little bit of stall buffet as we roll out right on center line. And just above two hundred. Kissing the asphalt. For a nice landing here at Fukien. Alright, I'm just going to roll out so that there's plenty of room behind me for my wingmen to land, not crash into me. Like I said, we seem to have lost one more at the very end there, for reasons unknown. Wow, there's another one. What's going on out there? Everybody, return to base, please. I would have assumed you were doing so, but I guess you have to be babysat. Stupid AI. Anyways. We're going to park it here, 
and we'll see you back in the debriefing room. Okay, welcome to the debriefing. Our objective today was to intercept that enemy flight approaching Yen Bai. Our flight time was 27 minutes and 49 seconds. The result was six primary targets were destroyed out of the eight. Two additional enemy aircraft were destroyed, which must have been those uh, F-8 Crusaders. And we lost three MiG-17s. However, despite six primary targets being destroyed, we still failed this mission for a score of only 300. As I said during the mission, Really, we should have, I should have dove down on them for a head-on pass, you know, right away, um, instead of putting them off to the side to try to, to try to swing around behind them, because then we couldn't catch up. So, that was, uh, that was on me. Let's see, let's move on. So here we go, I fired my entire ammo load for, uh, 13 hits and 3 kills. Pretty good. My wingman, 2nd Lieutenant Tao, he got 2 kills. And then, uh, let's see, one kill from Tiger 3. Tiger 4, 2nd Lieutenant Sam, never fired anything for some reason. Lieutenant Colonel Fook, our squadron commander, he got a kill today with a 37mm. Another kill for Captain Juan in the second flight. Lieutenant Yao didn't... He fired, but he was not able to hit anything. Lots of action today. But unfortunately, we also lost three MiGs. So let's check our roster and uh, let's see if anyone was killed. Um, we lost Captain Tew. He was killed in action. But everyone else is active. So here's the nice thing about playing the Vietnamese campaign is that even if you got shot down, if you punched out, you landed in friendly territory and then, you know, you would make your way back to your squadron and then return right to active duty. That happened all the time. Um, in fact, in real life, Win Van Koch, when he got shot down during Operation Bolo, um, him and all seven of the pilots that got shot down that day, they all landed safely. They ejected, landed safely, basically got in some trucks and drove back to Phuc Yen, you know, and then immediately were back on active duty. So uh, that's the case here, with the exception of Captain Fan Din Tu. Maybe let's look at the log. And, uh, and let's look at what happened to these guys today. Oh, Captain Tew is actually the guy that, that destroyed that first Crusader right off the bat. Oh, here we go. An F-8 Crusader fired an AIM-9B Sidewinder at Captain Tew. That might have been his undoing. Oh, and here's a second Sidewinder at him just a few seconds later. And a third, three Sidewinders at my guy, and he was finally hit by one of them. Uh, and he was shot down not near, f oh boy, Futo. So that explains what happens often when an airplane is hit with a missile in this game. It automatically will kill the pilot. As opposed to being hit by guns, where then you have the opportunity to eject. Um, he did not have the chance to do so here. He just was hit by that sidewinder and, you know, immediately disassembled the plane in flight uh, with Captain Two with it. So that was his demise, unfortunately. Oh, here's that F-105 that we saw cruising by alone. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Fook fired several rounds at it. I guess there was a whole bunch of them. I wonder if they were bombing or suppressing air defenses. Oh, Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Fook actually hit an F-105. That was, looks like maybe that was one of his kills. He took down a Thunder Chief. Captain Juan took down a Thunder Chief as well. So, I mean, here was part of our problem. I mean, we failed this mission, I mean, because I set us up wrong, but also when I told the entire squadron to engage air, like, nobody followed me into the actual primary target. Uh, I, I guess with the exception of that one MiG that was just right off my my wing there, and we, we blew up the Skyhawks together. But everyone else went chasing every other aircraft uh, over Vietnam, except for our mission targets. So, that didn't exactly help. Although, here's Lieutenant Colonel Fook destroying another Crusader, so he was kind of all over the sky. He was, I mean, at least we were engaging escorts, and maybe that helped us get the job done. 
Oh, and here we go. F-8 Crusader fired uh, Mark 12 cannons at Lieutenant Colonel Fook and then hit him. So he was shot down near the Sante Barracks and Supply Depot by the cannons of an F-8. So he was able to punch out and he survived. And then same thing with uh, Second Lieutenant Tao. He was also hit by cannons from a Crusader shot down near Sante. But he's back in the squadron too, so it was all F-8 Crusaders that shot down our guys. One with missiles, uh, killing our pilot, and then the other two with cannons, uh, including our squadron commander, getting shot down. But he's okay, uh, lives to fight another day. Alright, that's going to wrap it up for episode 2 of the North Vietnam campaign. Uh, much more successful for me in that I was able to actually return home to base. No damage, no crash landings, we made a nice regular... Uh, approach and landing uh, unfortunately we failed the mission so we'll just have to try again harder next time we did put a hurt on that squadron I mean that's six primary targets down you know if you imagine that a a squadron has 14 aircraft um, you know 12 to 14 aircraft we just did 50% damage to those guys so that's pretty significant and we got two crusaders so we did a lot of damage we just did it uh, we just didn't do it in time, so unfortunately we we lost. But that's going to happen a lot during this campaign. American numbers are just overwhelming, and uh, they're going to hit targets. There's not a lot we can do about it. If we can at least do damage to them after, while they're egressing, you know, that's, that's still a win. So thanks for joining me. I hope you like this one. Come back again and uh, see more episodes in this series as I do more flying and fighting over Vietnam. We'll see you then.